chief executive of such an important charity as Fort Alice. Could you briefly summarize the history of the organization and what you do? Fort Alice was set up in 1977 and how we started was um, one of our founding members actually took a phone call from somebody at the Samaritans and, and that lady was actually out with her two children and she'd nowhere to go. It was a bitterly cold night. And from there, she decided that we needed a refuge and she worked really hard to get a refuge going. That refuge initially comprised of a very small terraced house. Um, and the very first week we opened, we were full. We have progressed massively from that day. Our aspiration was always to have a refuge that was self-contained and not communal living. And we now have uh, a 22 apartment refuge with a capacity for up to 70 children. So the service has completely um, transformed and changed to meet the needs of those children and women that desperately need this service and desperately need to get out. Uh, during previous interviews, we've highlighted the need to address some of the help needed for potential victims to recognise abuse. You're already doing that, aren't you, with your work in educating young people? Yes, we do, we do an awful lot of work out in the community. And I think for us, that stemmed from children initially coming into the service and the damage children, it's not always recognised. We've done an awful lot of work with the police out in the community on getting them to identify that in a better way when they go out and do those first initial visits. But for us, we do a lot of work in schools. So we have a healthy relationships programme that runs. So we go out and do four individual sessions. All staff are trained, they're all trained teachers. And we do a session on educating staff. Domestic abuse is really difficult um, for people to work with. So much of the work that we do is based on risk. And for us, a lot of the work that we now do with children and young people, and we are really expanding our children and young people's services. But I've just done a session um, with one of our children and young people's workers. I'm horrified and very concerned at the length of the waiting list. But we've got children that are hearing voices, they're on suicidal ideation, they're cutting, and all this is a, a result of the domestic abuse that they've suffered. And I think when a child says to one of our staff, you know, I am so glad that this service is here to help me. And they don't actually say, I wish I'd not suffered the domestic abuse. I think that puts it into perspective how needed children and young people's services are. Jill, everyone's going through a challenging time with the recent res uh, restrictions with COVID. How has this affected you and your work? particularly with fundraising? I think with fundraising, we've had to really think about things very differently because obviously people can't be out there. So many things have been cancelled. Our fundraising activities that would be out in the community have gone. So we've actually started a fundraising campaign. And, and I would like to probably say at this point, um, Maxine Peake has just been stunning um, in helping us with that fundraising campaign. Helen Flanagan is another person that's been really good in helping us do that fundraising campaign but people have been incredibly kind and generous so we've had a lot of things running behind the scenes that people have helped us with that maybe wouldn't normally be happening so we've had to think very differently and very innovatively um, and that's working people's awareness is coming to the forefront and people are supporting us we've all already got an incredibly um, kind set of people that support us so I think we've just kind of worked more closely with those and done more focused pieces of work in a very different way. The recent legislation known as Clare's Law seems like a long overdue change that must help reduce the chances of at least some abuse from happening. Are there other aspects of the law that you think need looking at? I think there's lots of aspects of the law that need looking at, and I think it would be good to kind of revisit, particularly out of COVID, um, everything around the laws for people with domestic abuse. I still think there's a, there's a big piece of work to be done around publicising 
and making sure that everybody understands what each aspect of that law looks like. I think Claire's law has been brilliant and it's been a really positive way forward for people to be able to look at perpetrators but I do think we've got a big piece of work to do in getting people to understand what those laws look like generally not just in domestic abuse agencies absolutely right across the piece in lots of agencies. For everyone in this area in Bolton Fort Alice seems to be an exemplar of an organization supporting victims of abuse uh, it would make sense with what you do and all the expertise and your knowledge that this should be shared across the country. Is there a process of making this happen? We're already doing that in honesty, um, Gulnaz. When I first came into this area, one of the things that I looked at was the need. So I re-evaluated what we look like as an organisation. And for us, the heart of everything that we do will always be love, care and nurture. But one of the things that we have a, a huge focus on now is meeting need through different means. And that means actually working with people to ensure that when they leave us, they've had that love, care and nurture. But actually they are re-educated, they are empowered to be able to go out and there's still some hand-holding, but there's, there's networks set up. So people do quite often come to me um, across the country and ask if they can look at the model that, uh, that we've built as, as an organisation, and we do do it very differently. We actually link, I sit um, as a founding board member for an organisation called One Point, which actually feeds our counselling services. Um, so the model is a really good business model i do sit as a director for other companies but again it all feeds in and i think that's really important that partnership's really important so it's changed tremendously equally the offer has changed to be completely um encompassing every aspect of domestic abuse so yes we're already sharing we do quite a bit on television um People used to come and visit us. <laughs> now we use, obviously, through Zoom or Microsoft Teams, um, but we do share what we're doing. I think it's really important that. Jill, the technical advice on your website is astonishingly thorough, with instructions for closing down the site with one click, how that might differ between browsers, and how to cover any online tracks. Whilst this is incredibly thorough, it paints on too vivid a picture of peril. During lockdown, it's only through technology that victims can seek help. Has there been an increase in this method of getting in touch? And has that also increased the peril? Sadly, and, and I probably shouldn't say when I said, but we actually put um, an online chat in as soon as, as lockdown started because we recognised how difficult that was going to be. And, that online chat is actually backed up that once it's, it, it closes, because it isn't 24 hours, we have a 24 hour line into the service, but when that closes, there's five of us that actually get an email if somebody puts something up. Because whilst I appreciate when somebody's panicking, they may not see that that line is not open. So we all have that backup that we see it. And I think for me, when I get something through that says, I'm really scared, I'm in a mess, um, I need to get out and we're out of hours, we have to act on that. So yes, we have seen a huge increase. Um, we took 14, 14 calls in one day on that and actually reacted to that. We managed to get somebody out of the house um, and into refuge at that point. So that online has been absolutely invaluable for people to to touch base with us, and, and even if it is just that one line, but of course what comes with that was an awful lot of safeguarding. Of all the many innovative solutions that you have come out of Fort Alice, the IRIS project involving GPs seems to be really important. Can you tell us a little bit about that project, Jill? Yes, we've got two fabulous um, advocate educators that actually train the GPs in domestic abuse and then they actually act as that lead person. So the GP will then refer um, patients into that service. And it's about really making sure that we're picking up what we should be picking up with the patient. It's about reducing their anxieties. So the links are really, really clear. 
Um, the project's been running for five years and we're well over, I think we're on about 1,200 people through that service. And of course that's male and female victims. What that comes with again is the whole family unit sometimes. So that means that we will then start to pick up children and young people as well. And again, there's a huge increase with, with children and young people that come through that service. So it's been really successful um, and the links are good. We've again found different ways of working through COVID. Um, so we're moving to some training literally by, by using Zoom or Microsoft Teams. We did a conference the other day where we actually slotted into some of the GP stuff just to remind them we're still there. One of the good things that's come out of that that we talked about around that service is that people are actually coming back to us and we could say that's not good, but it probably is good from a point of view that we're able to care for them and they don't actually need the GP service so the GP can be focused where they need to be focused and we can pick up all that anxiety around domestic abuse and keep people safe. Uh, finally, Jill, uh, I wonder if you can tell us about future plans for Fortalis. Do you just get bigger, increasing the number of victims you support? Or do you want to see a future where there is simply less or no need for what you do? Is that a dream too incredible to believe? When you asked me that question, my initial part was excitement for providing services and we do need to extend those services for for victims of domestic abuse i would love to see where we're at i actually could finish work tomorrow and we're not needed um, that would be my ultimate dream it's not going to happen um, i'm very real about that the areas that we have got a real focus on expanding um certainly over the next year and we will do that i'm actually in that process at the minute um children and young people have to expand we have to meet those children's needs um, i don't think they've been met for it we just haven't had the capacity that's growing we're looking at different ways of working education's key we are training we've got some stuff that's going out nationally um, across the country with our training so that's being really developed um, and we're good to go with that we're just waiting to do some recordings and some podcasts that will go out to the british association of counselors and psychotherapists so that'll be there as a national model. Our training's all accredited. So again, it's about getting that message out. Education for me, I come from that background. Education and psychology was where I lived for a lot of years. Um, so that's another key area um, that we're working on. So we're out in the schools, we're working in the community, um, and we're able to educate children and young people. And again, you know, if I look at maybe last year with the healthy relationships that we ran in schools, you know, 56 children disclosed to us that they were having problems around domestic abuse that wasn't identified. So I think certainly education is key. I think children and young people are key. And I think generally victims, we need to look at what that need is like. Mental health is absolutely huge for us now. We have a drug and alcohol worker on site and we have a mental health worker on site. And that's going to have to grow. I want to share something with you, but I, but I need to do the visual bit. So let me move for a second. Okay. We had um, a young person that came into refuge with us and she came in and this is personal. I'd just like to share a, a, a nice story to end with. So forgive me, but, um, and she came into us and she was anorexic. She was a size four when she came in um, didn't, didn't communicate, didn't speak. Um, and the, the team worked incredibly hard with her. And during lockdown, just a couple of weeks ago, um, she came, they came to, to move on. And she came to me and she said, I just want to say thank you. And I've drawn you a picture. And I want to just share that picture. I'll describe it as I share it. But... No, forgive me, this could be the difficult part. I don't know how you can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so can we have a then? spotlight? Sorry. What she said was when she came in, and it really gets to me in some ways, but you know, she felt like she was locked in a jail, and you can see the padlock on it. 
all the teardrops or her teardrops and they were very dark when when she kind of came in but as she ran through the piece of work what she said was she now felt that she'd got a rainbow and there's a pot of gold just down here um that she feels that she's got for herself and she just it was just such a joy to see that young girl go out a size eight in clothes to do a beautiful piece of artwork for us and to be able to actually share that she got to where she needed to be and she felt free and she got a rainbow and a pot of gold and i don't know for me i just think it's it's a stunning example of where we can get victims to and we've lots obviously with with women as well but i just wanted to share that because it was current and forgive me you know what i'm like going <laughs> i'm a nightmare for wanting to oh, it's beautiful thank I you for sharing that. Thank you.